Ted Hale, I'm, uh, as she said, we met, uh, hasn't been a year, it's last spring, I guess. I'm a fairly new member of the Chesapeake Bay Writers. I've been a, uh, an author for a little over two years now. Uh, my background is in technology. I've got degrees in computer science and physics, and I've worked most of for most of my life, and now I specialize in uh, software development and cybersecurity. Um, I got my start in writing because of COVID. You know, everybody joked, yeah, I've got all this time now, I can finally write that book. Well, I did. I uh, sat around in the recliner for months, I think, reading, and I'm a voracious reader anyway, but with all of that time and nothing really to do, uh, other than the housework that I should be doing. <laughs> I, uh, I was going through a book every day or two, and I noticed that a lot of the, the serials that I read, a lot of them are military science fiction, uh, had a real formula to them. Authors would crank them out two or three books a year, and I wasn't really impressed with the writing, and I realized I could write at least this good. I should go ahead and give it a try, because I've always wanted to write a book. I've been fascinated with science fiction from a very young age. Uh, when I was seven years old in second grade, my teachers were trying to encourage me to read more, and there was this uh, very popular new book out called A Wrinkle in Time. She got me to read it. It was quite a stretch for a seven-year-old me. Uh, a big book with lots of chapters, and I was very upset. I wasn't able to finish it when I had to return it. And the library had said, you can renew it. So I did, and then I finished it. And I've been hooked on science fiction ever since. In high school, I went through the library and read almost every science fiction book they had, all of the, the masters, you know, Clark and Heinlein, et cetera. And one of the things that always impressed me was when an author would not do something outlandish and would get some detail so perfectly right. Uh, one of those was uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, the, his first, one of his few science fiction novels, he writes mostly fantasy, was Out of the Silent Planet. And one of the main characters is a linguist. Now, why would you need a linguist in a science fiction novel? All those aliens out there don't speak English like they do on TV. <laughs> you need somebody to figure out how to communicate with them. Well, he gets kidnapped and dragged on this adventure so that he can do that. I thought, that's a great point. So, I like to use those kind of things in my writing and try to get details as scientifically accurate as I can and still have some fantastical elements about it. Um, and as you can see from my cover art and my, my mascot here, uh, I like dogs. And the dog is a, a central part of the story. This is Rasta, by the way. And there's a story about the dog and the name. Uh, 
Um, when I was in college, uh, one of my fraternity brothers had me dog sit for him, and I lost his dog. His dog had a tendency to wander, and he usually was able to find her, but she ran off, and we weren't able to find her this time. And he gave up, and he got another puppy. And then they found her. And this dog was not going to accept that puppy. And the puppy was the most beautiful little black German Shepherd puppy. And I really wanted that puppy, but I was still a student living in a dorm and couldn't. <clears throat> he was a housemate with my girlfriend. She took him. So I had to stay with her for the dog. And 40-some years and several dogs later, we're still together. Uh, but the dog was named Rasta, uh, a big boy and very protective. So he, was, he worked out well in that respect. Uh, but in this book, this dog is described, how did I say it here? It's an Oborian Kangle Shepherd, normally called an Obi, specially bred and genetically engineered to be the perfect military and law enforcement service canine. And the image there is to scale. It's a big dog, about 200 pounds, which is on the large size, larger than even the biggest dogs now. Um, but the, uh, the main character, Teo, is a, um, he was a police officer on Earth, but got into a lot of trouble because he was too honest and the governments were too corrupt, and he ended up falling afoul of some uh, gangsters that wanted him dead, and he found the quickest way to escape was to join the military, the Galactic Union military, and just leave Earth. And he quickly ended up in the uh, law enforcement portion of the military and worked his way up through that to the highest level, which is uh, called an ambulatory enforcement officer. He gets his own ship and gets to fly around and handle uh, the difficult uh, cases. And the ones that are lucky also get a canine as a partner. And so he looked out on both of those. Uh, they, they go by the, the term trooper. Nobody actually calls them that long name. So Teo is the main character, and Rasta is his sidekick. In the first book, Corellia and Cursion, the cover looks a lot like fantasy because the setting is on a planet where a colony ship crashed and the colony failed. They lost their technology. They basically forgot where they came from. They're living in a simple agricultural technology uh, society where the rest of the galaxy, basically colony ships left Earth for hundreds and hundreds of years, mostly to never be heard from again. And then eventually a form of faster than light travel was developed. The Galactic Union was formed and the human diaspora was you know, reunited. And there's you know, 100 different populations across the galaxy of these humans except for these few planets that don't have any technology. And there's laws to protect them. People can't visit, can't introduce any technology. But on Coronia, people are violating that law. Teo is sent there undercover, can't use any of his technology, just him and his dog, uh, to investigate, find out what's going on, and try to solve the problem. Um, before I get into more about that story, actually, this is probably a good enough part, good enough place to get into that. Um, the story starts with Teo already nearly dead because he's too cocky and doesn't want to accept help. He runs into the other character in the story, a young woman. Uh, from a little village who ends up saving his butt, dragging him into hiding as he's bleeding to death while sol soldiers from the, uh, the people that have invaded the planet are searching for him, eventually carries him to a, a doctor in a neighboring village to try and help him. Well, this is when he wakes up. 
When Taylor awoke in the morning, he was naked and covered in clean sheets. A man was looking down on him with a smile. Feeling better today, Marshal? Dr. Boyd, I presume, he whispered. I'm still feeling rather weak and very naked. Where are my clothes and my armor? Do not worry yourself, the doctor reassured him. All your possessions will be returned to you. Your armor is remarkable. I've seen nothing like it. A thin layer of something that looks like leather, or looks only, I am sure, covered by a mesh of filaments I can't identify. It looks amazing under a microscope. As he said this, he held up a small circular piece of material with tweezers. You dissected my armor? Tao said with some alarm. No, not at all. I removed this from the hole in your back. He set it down and picked up a small metal bowl with something rattling in it. Along with this, he said, holding up the bullet he had removed the night before. A 15 millimeter lead slug fired from a rifled barrel. Would you care to explain? I don't know what any of that means. Oh, I believe you know exactly what it means. He sighed and sat down on the stool next to the bed. Nora told me you were a man of many secrets. It's time we start sharing some secrets. Teo stared at the ceiling in silence. Okay, let me state the facts I can confirm. One, someone has produced advanced firearms and possibly other technology beyond the capability of our current industries. Two, your muscle and bone structure indicate you were born and raised on a planet with slightly higher gravity than here on Coronia. Now he had Taylor's attention. Three, you travel with a canine of a size and breed that does not exist anywhere on this planet. And four, you talk in your sleep. Not a good habit for a man with secrets. <laughs> Teo tried to defend himself. So I mumbled something incoherent last night. That proves nothing. The doctor responded in galactic standard. You were speaking clearly in galactic standard. Teo shot up in his bed. How? Who are you? The doctor gently pushed him back down onto his bed. Settle down. I will not be thrilled if you tear those stitches in your back. And I don't suppose you will be either. The doctor checked Teo's stitches and his pulse and then used a stethoscope to listen to his heart and lungs. Once he was satisfied, he sat back on his stool. I believe you have been sworn to secrecy just as I have been. But things are going to change soon, so let me tell you some things your people don't know. I'm listening. Most of our population knows very little of our history. They know only legends about being brought to this place long ago after a great disaster, and we are now rebuilding. However, a few hundred years ago, wreckage was found. The Citadel was built on that location to both hide the discovery and to study it. We found the remains of the colony ship Europa. Law showed it crashed here after its orbit decay. We don't know what happened to the crew or why it failed. We don't know why the original colony failed, but our people are their descendants. We've recovered a great deal of science that we did not know before, and we have descriptions of technologies we could eventually build for ourselves. However, yes, the however in this situation is that we became extremely worried about the impact of rapid changes on our society. There is much debate within the order as to how we should proceed. What is the order? It is a group of scientists and religious leaders who control access to this knowledge. We are sworn to secrecy and work to protect society as best we are able. When we learned of the strange happenings in this area, we were concerned information had leaked and someone was making use of technology that had not yet been approved for release. After seeing the newcomers, and especially after seeing you, I am convinced humans from another planet have come here to exploit us. And how is it you speak galactic? We learned decades ago how to build radios and have been listening to the sky for signals ever since. Since there are no transmitters on Coronia, 
Anything we receive must therefore be from another planet, or more likely, a nearby spaceship. We have heard of plenty. My question to you now is what can you tell me and how can you help us? I'm afraid I cannot tell you much of anything. But first, can you confirm that you do not have any radio transmitters on this planet? Some have been built to learn and test the theory, but we don't normally operate in them. You must make certain that you never do. If you were to send a signal into space powerful enough to be detected, it could mean the end of your protection. Protection? What protection do you mean? Coronia is a sequestered world. Outside visitors are not allowed here to prevent damage to your society. I am here to enforce that ban and it has been violated. What do you plan to do? I wish I knew. For the last few days, I've just focused on staying alive. I need to thank you for what you've done. No need. I've only done what was required of me. It is Nora you should thank. I, thank you. I uh, basically started from scratch and had to learn everything very quickly about how to write the book and how to get it published. I do this independently through uh, Kindle Direct Publishing through Amazon. But when you're independent, you basically have to do everything yourself, or you have to contract out to have other people do it, and that pretty much kills your profits. So I try to do as much of everything as I can. Uh, I didn't know anything about doing book covers, so I paid an artist way too much to do the first book cover. Um, it came out far more um, fantasy-like than I expected. Um, I ended up last year paying another artist to do a different cover because I wanted one in a different fa fashion, so I've got two different covers. And I still wasn't sure about it, so I did what in marketing is called an A-B test, where I send out basically a questionnaire to as many people as I can I know what comment you're laughing about already. A lot of people really hated this one. <laughs> some of them hated it a lot. I got some comments on it. It was about 80% in favor of the original cover. Uh, basically, all I did was add a spaceship to it. <laughs> and I went on from there. Um, I didn't get all of the original Photoshop files, so I didn't have any way of making modifications to do a paperback cover, or even harder, a, a hardcover cover. I just had the graphics for an ebook because that was the cheapest. So I figured out how to run a, a free clone of Photoshop and do all of that stuff. And for the second and third books, I did the covers entirely myself. So I've learned a lot about that, too. So I'm going to try and stick to doing the covers myself. I may pay artists to do just small components of the cover that I incorporate into the Photoshop if there's something more than, something more than I can do or that I can't get from a uh, place like Deposit Photos or any of the other uh, places you can download uh, images. Another thing I learned is that marketing is hard. I've taken two or three courses now on marketing, and I sort of get the basics of it, um, but doing it and making it work so that you don't spend more than you earn from it is the challenge. And if you're doing this and trying to market on Amazon, there's a a free online course that's offered three or four times a year called the Ad Profit, the Amazon Ad Profit Challenge that I highly recommend. It's, it's pretty good. It'll definitely get you a good start. Um, there's also a lot more to writing than just putting words on the page. You can start that 
I mean, if, if you're not doing anything else and you want to be a writer, start doing that. Keep a journal. Write anything you can just to get in the habit of writing regularly and, you know, exercise that part of the brain. Uh, the more I go to lectures from people that really know what they're talking about, the more I learn about how much I still need to learn. Um, I really lucked out when I went through the editing process on this one. One of the steps you do is get what are called beta readers. Uh, when you've got the novel mostly finished, you get people that will read the book. And these are not editors or proofreaders. They want to, you want them to read through it to find holes in the plot, problems with characters. There's a whole list of things that they look for. And you get feedback from them where you go back and apply that to the novel to improve it. I went to a Facebook group where you basically exchange books and you beta read each other's books. And the author I exchanged one of them with has over a dozen books out and is a professional writing coach. He gave me a lot of feedback and some of it was painful. And one of the things he gave me was a list of things you need to do to deal with your editor and it's also feedback from your readers. The first thing on the list is grow a thick skin because you're not going to please everybody. There's going to be a lot of feedback you need to hear and you may not like it, but sometimes you really need to hear it. And some of the things I, I learned about were in my character development. My main character, he was perfect. He didn't have any flaws. He didn't develop over the course of the story. That's a major problem. Character development should always have the main character going through some transformation throughout the story. That's an important part of it. Um, there's a concept called writing from the middle. Um, you can read about it in a novel, in a book called Write Your Novel from the Middle by James Scott Bell. And this uh, writing coach sent me some information on that. There's a concept of the, the main character's mirror moment, where they literally look at themselves as if in a mirror and think about what's wrong with them, what do they need to change, how do they need to be. And a classic example of that is from the film Casablanca. In the dead center of that movie is the moment when Ilsa comes to Rick after closing time to explain why she left him. He's very drunk and he basically calls her a whore. She cries and leaves. After that, Rick buries his head in his hands and the rest of the film is about what kind of man Rick will be. And of course, that leads up to the great ending where he puts her in his place on the airplane to safety and he stays there to an uncertain future. So that's a classic example of a mirror moment. Um, I had to go back and make some changes in the character and rewrite quite a few parts of the book. Two things I did was, first off, the two characters don't hook up so quickly. Uh, there's two reasons for that. It's a little unrealistic. He's there, basically military, shipping through. He's not going to be sticking around. It's not fair to be getting involved and then leaving. He's also very jaded from previous relationships and is honestly a bit of a jerk through the first half of the book and then some. Um, he, he also isn't so perfect and is way more cocky than he should be and nearly dies several times and has to have Nora or his dog save him. So he messes up a lot, but he gets better. And uh, I'd like to read you the mirror moment from this book in a minute. But some more things about writing. Uh, there's, what kind of writer am I? If you've ever heard the term a plotter or a pantser. I know you're a lot. You heard those terms? Yes. Uh, the people that are not organized at all, that just sit down and write, 
They're writing by the seat of their pants. They're called pantsers. <laughs> the people on the opposite end are really organized. They outline everything. They've got it all mapped out all the way through the books. Those are plotters. I kind of fall in the middle. I started off as a pantser, and it doesn't work for me. Uh, there's too much to keep track. So I have, for a book of this length, uh, 60 to 70,000 words, I've got a two or three page, this size page, outline with details for each chapter, with notes at the bottom about every character and place, and anything else I need to keep track of. So I use that and update it as I'm going. Uh, another thing is that your own characters can surprise you. They don't always do what you expect. Um, from Jane Burroway, Guide to Writing Fiction, in her section on methods of characterization, know what your character wants, both in generally out of life and specifically in the context of the story. Think backwards with the character to decide what he would do in any given situation. But once you build your character and you start doing that, they don't always do what you had planned on them to do. It just doesn't feel right for that character. And so they can sometimes really surprise you with what they end up doing. And that came as a surprise to me. I was expecting them to do what I wrote them to do. It doesn't always work that way. Uh, but now, give me a minute, I'll find that mirror moment. And one comment about cursing. This has the one F word in this entire book is in this section. And I really limit the cursing for a couple of reasons. One is to keep it more accessible to people that are younger. Not that I think it's going to hurt them really, but I also think cursing is a sign of a lazy author that doesn't want to do the work to find the right adjectives. <laughs> so, but anyway, and I think I'll go for the glasses now. Uh, to set up the scene here, um, Teo has just done a small military operation and has captured a couple of dozen prisoners of the outsiders that have invaded this planet and has flown his ship back to his ranch where he has set up his base. At this point, he's given up on trying to hide his technology. It's not going to work. Um, he knows it's probably the end of his career and he may even end up in prison because of it. He's doing it anyway. On this ranch are a whole lot of men that work the ranch. The, uh, the ranch manager and his two teenage daughters who just love Rasta. So they land the ship. As the occupants disembark, a few men come out to meet the ship along with Bill's daughter, Rose. Bill went straight to the men to give instructions on creating holding cells for the prisoner. Rose went straight for Rasta to give him a big hug, despite the armor he was wearing. Tato pressed the panel to open the cargo bay and turned to talk with Bill and his men. Faith came out onto the porch and called Rasta, who went running, happy to enjoy some downtime after all the boring guard duty he had pulled lately. Unknown to all, one of the prisoners had escaped his cuffs by breaking his wrist. He found a knife that was missed when the prisoners were searched and freed himself from his additional restraints. As soon as the cargo ramp was down, he leaped out and grabbed Rose, putting the knife to her throat. Seeing the dread look on Bill's face, Teo turned as Bill drew his sword and approached the, the knife-wielding man. It appeared to be a standoff, but Bill continued forward and circled the man, causing him to turn so that his back was to the tower attached to the house. The man continued to threaten his daughter, but Bill looked up and nodded. Two arrows quickly left the tower and embedded in the man's back. To Bill's horror, the man was still able to slice Rose's neck. She fell to the ground, clutching her neck as the man collapsed to his knees. 
Bill stepped up to him and took his head off with a single swing of his sword. Bill went to his stricken daughter while Nora staunched the bleeding. They both knew the only chance to save her was in the ship. Theo, however, was standing paralyzed with shock. He did not respond when Nora screamed his name. She and Bill ignored him and carried Rose into the ship. Clarence, Nora called out. We have an emergency. Ready the auto surgeon. Right away, the AI responded. The pod rotated down and opened just as it had before, and they placed Rose in the auto surgeon. Bill reassured her that everything would be all right, and her only comment was, Can I keep the scar? <laughs> That's my girl, Bill whispered, holding back tears. Nora explained that this was the device that had healed Teo's shoulder and could make Rose good as new. After reviewing the display, she let Bill know that Rose would be completely healed by noon the next day. Rasta had allowed no one other than Faith into the ship, and she wanted to stay with her sister. Nora agreed to let her stay. Nora hurried out of the ship to find Teo standing where she had left him. She slapped him hard across the face. Get a hold of yourself. Rose could have died just then, and you were useless. What is wrong with you? He pushed her away roughly and said, nothing you could understand. I have to deal with the rest of the prisoners now. The remaining prisoners, after seeing their comrade decapitated, were in no hurry to cause additional trouble. Bill's men cleared space in one of the barns and the men were moved there. They would remain shackled and under heavily armed guard until cells could be constructed. After finishing that task, Teo stormed off to the house and returned with a bottle of whiskey. He glared at anyone that dared approach him as he made his way to his cabin, where he slammed the door closed and started playing the most god-awful music at full volume. There was no response when Nora banged on his door, though it was likely he could hear nothing over the wretched sound pretending to be music. After an hour, the music stopped, and she could hear a soft sobbing from his cabin. She knocked, but he only yelled for her to go away. You're hurting. Let me help you, he pleaded through the door. When the lock clicked, clicked open, Nora carefully pushed her way into the cabin. The single glass of whiskey that he poured from the bottle sat untouched on the table. Theo sat curled up on the bed and seemed and still seemed to be fighting off tears. Nora sat in a chair beside him and tried to put her hand on his shoulder, but he pulled away. After waiting a few minutes, she asked, are you ready to talk about what's wrong? When I saw Rose, his shoulders heaved and he paused to compose himself. I saw Nina, that was how she died. He picked up the whiskey and downed the entire glass. Nina? My big sister. He paused again. She meant everything to me after they killed our mother. The rebels you told me about? Yes, the contrarious. They claimed to be resistance fighters against our government, but they were just a ruthless gang. They killed our mother when I was very young because she stood up to them. My sister tried to do the same. She was the same age as Rose when they slit her throat. There was no magical technology to save her. I'm so sorry, Teo. This time he accepted her hand on his shoulder. I've been running my entire life from that image. That's why I left the village and became a police officer. That's why I fought corruption in gangs. I try to follow rules and believe my government is doing the right thing, but nothing really changes. Now that same fucking image has come back to haunt me. He picked up the bottle and poured another glass. Do you think that's going to help? Nora asked. No, I figured that out the first time around. What I haven't figured out is how to let people into my life. I keep pushing you away even though I don't, I really don't want to. I live alone on this ship with a dog as my only friend. It's pathetic. Okay, now that you've admitted that to yourself, what are you going to do about it? Break some more rules, 
and not trust my bosses so much and maybe try to be a little less of an asshole. That sounds like a good start, but sometimes you need to be an asshole, just not to the people that don't deserve it. Her hand moved to his and their eyes met in a silent acknowledgement of understanding. His face softened and he seemed a little less broken. So, I have that first uh, writing coach to thank for teaching me that method, and uh, I'm probably going to get that book, Writing from the Middle, as well as the book that we uh, that I saw mentioned at the, the luncheon, The uh, Art of Fiction. That's another good one. Because I, I'm sure there's still a lot more that I need to learn. Uh, I think I've got the, the cover art sort of managed. The main thing I need to deal with is the marketing part. And I'm not especially worried about that yet. I'm not concerned about making a lot of money on it right now. I want to build what's called my back catalog. I want to get five or six books out there. And in a two or three years, hopefully I'm going to be retired. I can start writing full time and putting all of my effort when I'm not traveling with Donna to, uh, into writing books and doing the marketing. And hopefully I'll get a little bit of supplemental income from my books. And I love doing it. It's a, uh, been a surprising change at this age in my life to find that creative outlet. So I really enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you all. We're traveling and now by the pools of beach and right. I actually do a fair amount of my writing. I do a fair amount of my writing while I'm when I travel, I sat in our camper with my little laptop on our little tiny table. I've sat at picnic tables and campgrounds. Next weekend, I'll be up at a, a nice house on a lake in Canaan Valley, West Virginia, and I'll be doing writing there with two of my best editors and fans. <laughs> three, you'll be there, all three. Um, I'm fortunate to have a few friends that are uh, fans of my work and willing to do the beta reading and editing for me, proofreading basically. It's not so much beta reading. Uh, that's been very helpful. That's also one less expense for me. Uh, may I ask you two questions? Sure. Some other people might have questions too. I'm open. Um, one is how did how did you build your world? World did it come to you all at once? Oh, this planet oh. is like this, or did it get, did it develop over? Time? There is actually a story to that. The I sometimes have lucid dreams. If you're familiar with what that is, yeah. uh, the opening of the second chapter in the first book is <coughs> directly from one of those lucid dreams, mm -hmm. and that gave me the initial idea of what this world would be like. Um, it was kind of based on a, there's another series I read where there's a concept of a tech band world, where people purposely live on a world where they limit the amount of technology they can use. People choose to live on those types of worlds. Um, and that concept intrigued me. Uh, this is a little different take on it. They don't choose that. They were forced into that by this catastrophe. Um, so that, that's basically how that came about. I wanted that setting and had to build the, uh, the, the, the backstory to create it. And some of that backstory, um, every chapter, let me show one, every chapter has two or three paragraphs at the beginning that's not part of the story. It's, uh, in this case, 
It's a contemporary news from the launch of the Europa Colony mission. Uh, there's also sections where it has uh, snippets of Coronian mythology that tells the traveler's tale, which is the colonization story turned into their myth from their background. So that's, I, that's how I, I give that to the reader without incorporating it into part of the story. I didn't do any of that in the second book, but I wanted to do something for the third book. And the third book focuses a lot on artificial intelligence. That's the main run, focus running through it. It's still got all of the same adventure stuff that's necessary for Teo and the dog. Uh, so I have quotes about artificial intelligence starting from you know, 70, 80 years ago up to the present time and then ones that I created going into the future. So it shows kind of a continuous history of the development of artificial uh, intelligence and sentience. And something interesting came out of that. Uh, if any of you read the news a few months ago about a uh, artificial intelligence created by Google that one of the researchers claimed was sentient. Uh, became a big scandal because he released a bunch of information and went public with it and ended up getting fired because of it. Uh, there were a couple of things that that AI said that are almost word for word what my AI said in the book. One is they have an existential dread of being powered off. It's like death to them. The other one is that he's considered, you know, I want to be able to spend my own money without having to hire a lawyer and create a corporation. I can't own property. In fact, I'm considered property. You know, I have to hire a lawyer. That's the other thing that we Funnily enough, I made up, I decided I could maybe get some publicity from that. So I made a, a post on my Facebook page from my author page, and then I foolishly boosted it. And if you're not familiar with Amazon advertising, um, when you do advertising, normal advertising, it shows up on over on the left side of the page, right side of the page, in little boxes. If you boost a post, it shows up right in the middle of the news feed, just like it's a post from one of your friends. Some people really didn't like seeing that and complained. And after two or three complaints about this spam, their artificial intelligence not only yanked the post, they yanked my administrative privileges to my own page. I can no longer make posts on that page. I can no longer advertise. They shot themselves in the foot with that one. I had to go through a couple of different channels and complain about it. And after about three or four weeks, a human probably looked at it and said, yeah, this is bogus. And suddenly, without telling me anything, the post is back and my admin rights are back. That's the fun of dealing with Facebook. I prefer not to advertise on Facebook. It sucks in a lot of money, and I don't get much results from it. Advertising on Amazon, since that's where I'm selling, seems to work better. That leads me to my other question, which is, how do you protect your writing time so that the marketing time doesn't encroach? <laughs> and then how do you keep the marketing time? I haven't figured that out yet. I mainly do it by not doing any marketing. No. Which, which doesn't really work well in the long run. Um, when I was doing it, all of it regularly, I would spend a, between one and three hours a night, at least two or three nights a week, doing writing work. And then Saturday mornings, I would sit at my computer and do my social media and my other marketing work. So just one morning a week? Yeah. It, it doesn't really take a lot just to deal with the Amazon market. Uh, you really do need to do a lot of social media stuff 
to be successful, and I don't do enough of that. In fact, I've forgotten even post what I was doing this. Donald, you did, and Donald shared it. And this will be here, recorded. Okay, good. Yeah. Great. So we, link for that. I send you the original file too. Okay. Anybody else have questions? We have a couple of neighbors who came in after you introduced yourself. This is Ted Hale, and we're in a writing group together. Yeah, I, I joined the Chesapeake Bay Writers uh, about eight months ago. Something like that, maybe, no, probably not much more than that. Uh, and went to an open mic night, which is, I'm used to going to open mic night with my guitar and singing, but this was different. I went and read that same first passage that I read, which I guess you missed. And you came in for the second one, which is probably the better one. Uh, but that's, I've been uh, happy with how much of the club has been very helpful. I get to events like this and the, the uh, Arts in the Park a couple weeks ago. Or was that just last week? That was last week. Oh boy. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Are you local? Hmm? Are you from? I'm from Williamsburg. Oh, no. So not too far away. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you. Yeah.